Senator Ludlam. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy Chair. I rise um, to support this amendment, although it has, as I suspect it has with others, caught some people somewhat by surprise, and I want to spell out my reasons for supporting the amendment now. I wish that the amendment were unnecessary, to be quite honest. I have a certain sympathy for Senator Fifield as the rest of the chamber lined up and said that this bill is largely innocuous, largely a housekeeping measure. Um, he's correct about that. But this is some unfinished business and some unfinished housekeeping that we shouldn't be needing to deal with today. The amendment that's been circulated requires NBN Co to provide, in the period beginning 1 July 2015, ending 30 June 2022, forecasts for each financial year during the period of the following information. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but a couple of the ones that jumped out. Number of premises ready for services for each access technology. Number of premises activated for each access technology. Revenue, operating expenditure, cash, uh, cash flow and uh, net levels of government debt. Why is this information not already in the public domain? Why do these forecasts have to be extracted by the Senate in this fashion? Why is this material not already exist? Senator Conroy and I, and those who have been participating in this debate since 2008 and onwards, we had plenty of run-ins about the strategy, the performance of NBN Co, some of the technology choices, some of the market choices, but the debates were always carried out against the backdrop of information that was being handed over by Mr Quigley and his team. And what it meant was that we were able to, to compare the forecasts that were being generated by the government or by NBN Co when it only had a handful of staff against the actuals. When the volume rollout finally began and we finally got a sense of who was taking up the technology, what speed tiers they were taking up, how the network was performing, how long it was taking to roll out, what it was costing per premise. We were able to go back and we were able to say these forecasts were wrong and these ones were reasonably accurate. But at least we were acting on the basis of publicly accessible information. It wasn't always easy. I can recall Senator Minchin when he was uh, shadow communication spokesperson and the Greens. You can go back to the record, if you like, and you can find instances where the Senate was tabling orders for production of documents out of Senator Conroy when he was the communications minister. But we got there, and by the time the volume rollout started, everybody, whether you supported the model of the project or not, could base your arguments on the performance of the network on data and on information. So let's go back to where this began, before the election. You did. Mr Abbott instructed his communication spokesperson, Mr Turnbull, to go out and demolish the case for the NBN. And they sought out to destroy anything that had Labor's name attached to it or had the Greens' name attached to it. The carbon price, CEFC, the Renewable Energy Agency, the, M the Minerals Resource Rent Tax and the NBN, anything at all that reminded Mr Abbott of the six years of achievement under the former government was to be destroyed or demolished was the term that was chosen. And so they came out as one of the bizarrest press conferences that I think I've ever seen with this project or this proposal for a cobbled together half-baked national broadband network that was going to cost $29.5 billion and instead of future-proofing the country with an end-to-end -end fibre network. We would use a bit of copper, we'd use a bit of HFC, we'd use some satellites, we'd use some wireless towers, we'd have this mongrel network, big parts of which will be obsolete on the day they are built and will need to be torn up and replaced with the kind of end-to-end -end fibre network that this parliament legislated for, that got the country independence, Mr Oakeshott and Windsor, across the line in 2010 to support a minority Gillard government. I'm not here to speak for them, but we all know that telecommunications played a very big part, not just in the election campaign, but in the decision that those decisions that in part allowed Ms Gillard to form government in the first place. $29.5 billion they said it would cost. Then come December 2013, the strategic review says, oh, actually, it'll be 41. We, we misunderstood. Our election promise wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. It's going to be $41 billion. And yet August 2015's corporate plan for 2016 says we're up to $56 billion. 
How on earth did we get here? You're stuck with an obsolete copper network that you're having to scrape the garbage out when you're discovering that it's been taped together with gaffer tape and plastic bags. We're stuck with a reliance on Telstra, who know where the bodies are buried, and we're actually pretty happy to offload their network, which different spokespeople at different periods of time have said is no longer fit for purpose, back to the taxpayer. Your network rollout is way behind schedule. The fibre to the node network is way behind schedule. The satellites are apparently at or approaching capacity. And so Australians are getting a telecommunications network that will be slower, more expensive and delivered later than an all fibre build. What act of genius put this together? Dismantled something that was going to work. And we all recognise, we had plenty of run-ins in this place about delays and about cost overruns. I think the cost overruns arguments were overblown and they weren't being reflected in the volume rollout data that Mr Quigley was putting to Senate committees. But yes, the network was delayed. It was delayed by asbestos in the pits. It was delayed by a subcontracting pyramid that was six layers deep in some places. And it was delayed by the inherent complexity in doing something as complex as this, this decommissioning a network that is decades old in some parts of the country, not particularly well maintained, and replacing it with an entirely new technology. Yes, it was running behind schedule. But instead of coming in and cleaning out the mess of subcontracting arrangements <coughs> that had been put in place and throwing strong parliamentary oversight over the build, the coalition demolished it. And now we are left with a mess that we're in today, that the Senate has to come forward with an amendment in this slightly unorthodox manner to ask for basic information so that the debate can proceed at very least on the basis of data. And then we can have our disagreements about how they're performing. Personally, I think Mr Morrow is playing the best hand he can with a pretty rotten set of cards. And others may well disagree with that. I think he's, he's doing the best he can with the cards that he's been dealt. But he has been set up to fail. <coughs> NBN Co has been set up to fail. And now we read, although it's disputed, Senator Fifield, you are very welcome through you, Mr Chair, to provide some light on this, if you like, because this, unfortunately, has now passed into your responsibility, and I wish you well with it, because I think you've been dealt a mess through you, Mr Chair, that apparently there are moves to privatise the shambles. Now, apart from the fact that you wonder where on earth you would find a buyer for a half-built, cobbled-together mishmash of a network such as the one that you're trying to build, but I can well remember the amendments that the Australian Greens put forward when the Labor Party was proposing that, in fact, there would be an automatic assumption that when the build was complete, it would be privatised, that when the network was complete, we'd, it would go back to the market, despite the fact that we had we'd just been through this argument that the wholesale network is a natural monopoly. It's like the freeway network. It's like the water distribution network. It's like the electricity network. You don't want two sets of power lines running down the street to try and set up some arbitrary form of competition at the wholesale layer. You don't want that in telecommunications networks either. You want the wholesale NBN network in public hands where the bosses can be brought into estimates committees and can't hide behind commercial confidentiality, where budgets are tabled, where questions can be asked and answers can be provided. And you want that at the wholesale natural monopoly layer. And you want NBN Co to stay in that box and to do one thing and to do it well. And then you want to let competition rip at the retail layer. And I think that the, the market structure that this parliament decided on after exhausting late night debates, night after night, was effectively and essentially the right one. And now this proposal that we're somehow going to privatise the network, who's going to buy it? We all know who is going to buy it. Telstra is going to buy it. And so we will be back to the bad old days that they sold their network, they sold this obsolete copper network to the taxpayer, and you're going to be handing this whole mess of garbage back to them to fix up. Now, it may be that there are no intentions to privatise the network, and I'll just remind senators who maybe are a little bit less familiar with what's in the Act that we removed Labor Party's automatic assumption of privatisation. That's no longer there. So it would be up to the government of the day to not initiate a sale if they chose. That was our first amendment. Our second amendment is related to the fact that the Productivity Commission and a parliamentary committee would be stood up to assess whether privatisation is in the public interest. At least we would take evidence as to whether that was the case or not. I'm making the case 
this afternoon that it would strongly not be in the public interest to privatise the network. But we would let the evidence uh, speak for itself. And the third safeguard that we placed in the bill was that any proposed sale would be subject to a vote in this parliament, as informed by the PC, as informed by a parliamentary inquiry. What kind of network is it that this government even proposes to sell? It's a huge loss-making entity at the moment because it's barely even a quarter built because the rollout is a shambles. And again, it is no disrespect to the people who have been dealt these cards to Mr Morrow and his team. I genuinely wish them well, but they have been set up to fail. So the least that we can do is not to make it worse. Senator Fifield, you've not had the opportunity to speak on this amendment yet. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I would struggle to understand a justification for not supporting this amendment. At the very least, as we have our debates about what kind of telecommunications network is fit for purpose, you see Mr Turnbull, yourself, Mr Wyatt, other spokespeople talking about agility, talking about innovation, talking about a future focus, talking, heaven forbid, about diversifying our economy away from bulk exports of depleting low-value commodities. What better way to underpin these other vitally important parts of our economy than with world-class telecommunications? My hometown of Perth is in Beijing's time zone, which stretches all the way to Eastern Europe. What better way to connect with the rest of the planet than with world-class telecommunications? And what is it that we have been served up is expected to be blindfolded to the basic data underpinning the projections of this network and how fast they think they can get it built. And it's a network that will be obsolete on the day that it gets switched on. We have to be able to do better than this. So unorthodox although it may be, this information should be in the public domain. This amendment should pass and then we can all get on with our day. I thank the Chamber.